grace, and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Wilmette on this Good Friday, on this day in which we remember the faithfulness and agony of our Lord and Savior as he went to the cross, portraying the power of love, overcoming the scourge of loveless power. Today's worship service is one of scripture and song and prayer. In particular, we will recite the entire Passion account from the Gospel of John, hear a brief reflection, and go peacefully and faithfully into this night of darkness, remembering that it's Friday, but that Sunday's coming. But for now, it is Friday, and we stay here, trusting God's presence is with us. Will you join me in the gathering words as they appear on your screen? Friends, let us worship God. Along this way, we have walked with Christ. Along this way, we have shared his table. Along this way, he has washed our feet. Along this way, we approach the cross. Along this way, we fear the path. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let us join together in the opening prayer. God of the daytime and the nighttime, God of light and darkness, God of joy and sorrow, we worship you. Through you alone, we are able to know that even in the darkest hours, hope is present through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Jewish leaders led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's place. It was early in the morning. So that they could eat Passover, the Jewish leaders wouldn't enter the palace. Entering the palace would have made them ritually impure. So Pilate went out to them and asked, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered, If he had done nothing wrong, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate responded, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jewish leaders replied, the law doesn't allow us to kill anyone. This was so that Jesus's word might be fulfilled when he indicated how he was going to die. Pilate went back into the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation as chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, my kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If I did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason 
to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth? Pilate asked. After Pilate said this, he returned to the Jewish leaders and said, I find no grounds for any charge against him. So you have a custom that I release one prisoner for you at Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted, no, not this man. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas was an outlaw. Let us pray. O oh God, what is truth? Jesus came to witness to the truth. What is truth? The truth was in Jesus, and for many that truth was hard to take. What is truth? God helps us to keep asking, to keep open minds so that the truth of your love for each one of us can enter in. Amen. Amen. A reading from John 19, verses 1 through 16. Then Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Over and over, they went up to him and said, Greeting, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate came out of the palace again and said to the Jewish leaders, Look, I'm bringing him out to you and let you know that I find no grounds for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. When the chief priests and the deputies saw him, they shouted out, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, You take him and crucify him. I don't find any grounds for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders replied, We have a law, and according to this law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be God's son. When Pilate heard this word, he was even more afraid. He went back inside into the residence and spoke to Jesus. Where are you from? Jesus didn't answer. So Pilate said, you won't speak to me? Don't you know I have the authority to release you and also to crucify you? Jesus replied, you would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. That's why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From that moment on, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. However, the Jewish leaders cried out saying, if you release this man, you aren't a friend of the emperor. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he let Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench at a place called Stone Pavement. It was about noon on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, here's your king. The leaders cried out, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate responded, what, do you want me to crucify your king? We have no king except the emperor, the chief priests answered. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. Let us pray. God, help us. It's so easy to go with the crowd, not to stand out, to say what everyone says. We want Barabbas. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify. We blame those people in the crowd 2,000 years ago. But if we had been there, would we have done the same?
The third reading comes from John chapter 19, verses 16b to 22. The soldiers took Jesus prisoner. Carrying his cross by himself, he went out to a place called Skull Place, in Aramaic Golgotha. That's where they crucified him and two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a public notice written and posted on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Therefore, the Jewish chief priest complained to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. Let us pray. O oh God, Pilate was a powerful ruler, and yet he gave in to political arguments and a mob who shouted for blood. Pilate was a weak man, and yet he got one thing right. He wrote that Jesus was a king. A king with no power at all, a man discarded on the town garbage dump, lying like a criminal on a shameful cross. And yet here was a man filled with the power of God to change the world. Come Jesus, change us. Come Jesus, reign in our hearts. Amen. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and his sandals and divided them into four shares, one for each. His shirt was seamless, woven as one piece from the top to the bottom. They said to each other, let's not tear it. Let's cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. That's what the soldiers did. Let us pray. O oh God, whose gospel is full of signs, the seamless robe, work of human hands, which the soldiers couldn't tear, so they gambled for it instead. Seamless, one piece, it reminds us of the way we belong together, with each other and with believers down the centuries. Each connection we make brings us nearer to you. We know that Jesus was a carpenter who died on a wooden cross, the work of human hands. And so we pray, Christ, the master carpenter, who through wood and nails shaped our whole salvation, wield well your tools in the workshop of your world, so that we who come to your bench may here be fashioned to a truer beauty by your hand. We ask for it in your name's sake. Amen. Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. After this, knowing that everything was already completed, in order to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was nearby, so the soldiers soaked a sponge in it, placed it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When he had received the sour wine, Jesus said, it is completed. Bowing his head, he gave up his life. Let us pray. Living Lord, 
living word, living water. We know that in many places in our world, people are thirsty. They suffer from drought. They walk miles to collect water. What little water they have is polluted and makes them sick. Forgive us when we take plentiful, clean water for granted. May we never waste it, and may we find ways to give practical help to those without. But also remind us, God, that in Jesus you shared our human lives and our suffering. You knew what it was to be weary, in pain, and overwhelmed with thirst. You understand our deepest need. Thank you. Thank you for being there for us. Amen. The sixth reading from the Gospel of John in the 19th chapter, beginning with verse 31. It was the preparation day, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, especially since that Sabbath was an important day. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of those crucified broken and the bodies taken down. Therefore, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who were crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw this has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he speaks the truth, and he has testified so that you also can believe. These things happen to fulfill the scripture. They won't break any of his bones. And another scripture says, they will look at him whom they have pierced. Here ends the reading. Let us bow together in prayer. Compassionate God, as we remember Jesus, whose love for humanity brought him to the cross, we remember the world for which he died. We remember the seamless fabric of creation, which we are doing our best to tear, gambling for its possession. We pray for forgiveness for what we are doing to your world. We remember places and nations where there is conflict. Remember the conflict in our own nation the sharp divide between rich and poor, the crisis of confidence in those in power, the aftermath of the devastating pandemic. We pray for a fair distribution of resources and compassionate care for the weakest in our own society. We remember conflicts very close to home, recognizing that 
when we have a part to play in them, praying for healing. And we remember those who are suffering now in body, mind, or spirit. We believe in a mystery, just as Jesus shared our mortality and pain as he died on the cross, so you are with those who suffer now. And your wounded hands stretch out with healing and hope. Thank you, God. The seventh reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 38 through 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the religious authorities. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the one who at first had come to Jesus at night, was there too. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, nearly 75 pounds in all. Following Jewish burial customs, they took Jesus' body and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths. There was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus in it. Good Friday, this day of anguish, pain, and questions, of facing the long shadows and darkness around and within us. This Good Friday feels different this year. It means something different for our world. We're now in the midst of our second Holy Week in the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well over 540,000 dead in our own country and 2.7 million around the world. A year of political polarization like no other, or at least the likes of which few of us have ever seen. A racial justice reckoning after the killing of George Floyd that has been a long time in coming, but whose progress is still very fragile. And in the past two weeks, a tragic reminder of the prevalence of mass shootings, of violence, one in Atlanta and another in Boulder. But the truth is, Good Friday means something different for us probably every year, if for no other reason than the fact that you and I are different. Our lives have changed in ways we did not anticipate a year ago. We've experienced pain and joy and been transformed by both. Even as each Good Friday feels a little different, it always brings up similar questions for us, one of which is the atonement, a fancy theological word that simply gets at the question of how does a just and loving God forgive sinners? In other words, how do people become reconciled to God? And did Jesus really have to die for that to happen? Theologians tell us there are several different theories of the atonement, elaborate explanations of how this process works. Scholars have spilled rivers of ink defending their views, but in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis reminds us that no explanation of the atonement is as relevant as the fact of the atonement. You and I are reconciled to God. That's the clear point, the center of the good news. That's the indescribable gift of God's grace, and any explanation of it, however sophisticated, is always secondary. But there is one theory of the atonement, perhaps the most popular one these days, that I'd like us to ponder for a moment this Good Friday. It's called the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. It was developed by St. Anselm in the 12th century, a little more than a thousand years after Jesus' life and death and resurrection. In this view, God is a righteous judge 
who demands perfect obedience. When we sin, we fall short of God's command, and this requires punishment. This puts God in a hard place, because if God is loving, God would not want us to die. So even though God and God's love may want to forgive us, God cannot, because it would be a breach of, of God's justice. In this penal substitutionary view, Jesus becomes then our, our fill-in, our, our substitution that bears God's wrath, God's anger, God's justice. Since Jesus is a human being, he can stand in the place for all of humanity, but because Jesus is also God, he is perfect in every way, thus satisfying God's need for a sinless sacrifice. Jesus saves us, then, by giving himself in our place and receiving the punishment you and I deserve. Because our debt is paid, we're restored to a good relationship with God in which God once again loves us. While this particular view of the atonement, this belief about the cross, seems logical, it's extremely problematic. Why should one person's punishment especially a person who didn't do anything wrong, cover everyone else? Wouldn't that discourage our motivation to live a good life if we knew we were never personally responsible for our own actions? And is it truly forgiveness if someone else pays our debt? If I am behind on bills and a friend of mine pays off the balance, my debt has not been forgiven or released. It has simply been shifted to another person who took care of it. That's not forgiveness, at least as we understand it. And then there's the major problem with who God appears to be in this penal substitutionary view, namely that, that God appears angry and unrelenting, almost bloodthirsty, that God cannot act in love toward us until someone offers sacrifice, is a pretty disturbing picture of God, and one that appears so counter to the God we come to know in Jesus Christ. David Loesch, the president of Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, reflecting on Good Friday, writes this. The major problem with this understanding of God and the cross is that it enjoys relatively little support from the biblical witness. In particular, note that Jesus doesn't wait until after his sacrifice on the cross to offer God's forgiveness. In fact, in the ministry of Jesus, it's the very fact that Jesus goes all over the place announcing God's forgiveness that so riles up his opponents in the first place. Again and again, people take exception to the declaration of Jesus that your sins are forgiven at various points, questioning his authority or accusing him of blasphemy. Jesus didn't come to make God loving, but because God is loving. Jesus didn't die to appease a ticked-off deity. Rather, threatened by the unconditional love and forgiveness of God that Jesus proclaimed, the political and religious authorities put Jesus to death to quash the hope he created and to retain their power. Forgiveness presumes guilt, and rather than admit their guilt, they executed the one offering forgiveness. But God vindicated Jesus' message by raising him from the dead, demonstrating that such self-giving love is more powerful than hate, and that God's promise of life is always stronger than death. From this point of view, God in Jesus joins us in absolute solidarity by taking on our lot and our life, even to the point of death and at the same time promises that death does not have the last word. That, in the end, life and love win. No wrath, no anger, no horrendous punishment or logic-bending substitution is necessary. Good Friday is beautiful, friends, not in a twisted way, as if suffering, agony, or punishment are somehow good things, but because it is a day drenched with God's love, a love that is there before, not because of, the cross. It is never God's will for a righteous person to die like Jesus, but 
God has and God will continue to use the darkest evil in this world somehow, some way, for good. It was because our sinful world resisted Jesus' message of love, mercy, peace, and justice that the cross was lifted up and that Jesus died upon it. Jesus' passion for the kingdom of God and his desire to show us the face of God's love, that is what brought him to the cross. God is not angry with you, friends. God loves you. And yet, this doesn't absolve us from absolutely, desperately needing a Savior. Even if Jesus wasn't a stand-in for our punishment, we are still sinners thirsting for grace. We have a broken world and broken lives, and while we do our best to heal the world, to be a part of doing shalom, there are days we do rip it apart more than we mend it. Last August, our third child, Noah, was born. What a precious gift he was and is to our family, but he did arrive at a crazy time. In the midst of the pandemic and remote learning and all of the dramatic changes this past year has brought, never before in my life have I felt so stretched as a partner, as a parent, as a pastor, as a person. My sin and shortcomings have been there for me to face head on on a daily basis. My clutch for control, my lack of trust in God, my sense of scarcity over all that there is to do and the little time I have in which to do it, my frustration and envy at times, wondering how other people seem to be handling life so much better than me. In these difficult moments, I've been unable to avoid the reality that I have failed and will fail my spouse, my children, my church, and myself. I reflect on some decision I made the day before or neglected to make, some, some word I said or left unsaid, and sometimes I feel small and sometimes filled with shame. Of course, this is nothing more than the specter of sin, right? That which separates us from God, from love, which we are all caught up in. But when I'm, when I'm curved inward, when I'm in that shame spiral, as Brene Brown calls it, it's hard to climb out. The deeper truth that often eludes me in these moments is that the first and primary attribute of God is love. God's love is unwavering, not passive, but powerful. A love that accepts us as we are and not as we ought to be, but also a love that's too strong, too fierce, too gracious, too generous to leave us just as we are. On this Good Friday, when I consider the agony and betrayal Christ underwent, the faith and hope that propelled him, I marvel at the unstinting testimony of love that undergirded it all. Good Friday is, is all about this divine power of love that Jesus represents, overcoming the scourge of loveless power that Pilate represents. There's a prayer of confession we sometimes say here at FPCW on Sunday mornings in worship that goes like this. Gracious God, accept us as we are and not as we ought to be this morning. Transform us into new people. Deliver us from the certainty of being right, the vanity of self-absorption, and the temptation to blame everyone else. By your grace, we can grow, we can come alive, we can change a little part of your world for good. So forgive us, God, for what we've done and left undone, and help us to become better disciples of Jesus Christ, today, tomorrow, and the next day. Amen. Friends, this is the call of Good Friday, God's promise of life and light and love win. Even on the darkest of days, when we come to our knees and ask God's help in becoming new people, it is at the cross that our real and raw brokenness as people, as communities, 
will be met by a transformative love only God can offer. By God's grace, we really can grow. We really can come alive. We really can change a little part of God's world for good. That is the good of this Friday. Thanks be to God. Amen. Were you I invite you now to join with me in the responsive, departing words. When hope has left, still we watch and wait. When darkness prevails, still we search for light. When the road is hidden, still we seek a guide. Christ of the cross, hold us in these moments. As we wait for a garden vision, a mealtime revelation, a locked room blessing, and a lakeside renewal. And now, friends, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Amen. <laughs>